Hello, everybody. Um, this is the FRQ, the free response questions that cover the topic of F prime and F double prime number line. Um, all of these are a collection of problems that have been pulled from past AP exams. I think this is a good time for us to kind of stop and kind of look at um, some things that we've learned and, and see how they're tested uh, AP style, free response anyway. Uh, the front is kind of time consuming, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do problem number three. In my opinion, number three is probably the most difficult problem on the front here, on the F prime and F double prime number line. Um, I would think of a scale of one to five that it's up there at a five. Um, if it's not a five, it's certainly close to a five uh, level of difficulty, in my opinion. All right, so I'm going to do that problem, and if you guys would tonight for homework complete to the best of your ability, uh, the rest of the problems on the front. I'm also going to do one problem from the back. And all the problems on the back are very similar, so once we do one, then you guys should be able to, within two minutes, answer the remaining questions on the back. All right, take a moment and read through question number three. All right, number three says, let f be a function defined by f of x equals k times the square root of x minus natural log of x for x greater than zero. And um, that's going to be uh, proved to be pretty important to us. Uh, where k is a positive constant. So we know k is a positive constant multiplier. Uh, it's important to pay attention to this information just because sometimes k behaves as a variable and sometimes k behaves as a constant. And how you proceed um, is determined uh, by whether k is that constant or that variable. So make sure and pay attention to how k is defined. All right, part A, easy enough. So you're probably thinking, well, why is this the most difficult problem? Well, it's actually when you get to part C. So part A, I would think that this part A was probably worth at least two, possibly three, three points out of nine. All right, um, for A, I'm going to get the function ready for differentiation. Um, that's A. So F prime of X, let's use the power rule. K is a constant multiplier. Using the sum and difference rule, focusing our attention here. It's been a while. The derivative of natural log of x is 1 over x. Done. That's our derivative. It asks us to also find f double prime. So I'm going to kind of take a look at f prime. Is it ready for differentiation? Well, this term could be rewritten unless you absolutely wanted to do the quotient rule, which is fine. But I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to take just a moment and I'm going to rewrite f prime. This term's good, ready for differentiation, is the second term. Now I'm ready for f double prime. Apply the power rule again here, multiplying. Reducing the exponent by 1. Uh, focusing my attention over here, it is the power rule. I don't have to do quotient rule. Um, that will become plus x to the negative 2. You don't have to rewrite it. Um, I'm done. I've received um, all the points allocated for that skill. All right, the problem does wrap up to the next column, so uh, just kind of keep looking back at this information if you need it to help you with Part B and C. Okay, let me forewarn you that Part B and C um, does require a lot of space, and I was just trying to conserve space here. So if you want to do Part B and C on your own notebook paper, that's probably not a bad idea. I'm going to run out of room, I'm sure. I'll do the best I can. For what value of the constant K, okay, looks like I might have to find K. For what value for K does the function have a critical point number at x equals 1. If I have a critical point at x equals 1, that tells me in notation that f prime of 1 equals 0. 
So my plan is find my derivative that I just found, plug in 1 for x, set it equal to 0, solve for k. That was a lot. Let's go back and find the first derivative and everywhere we see x, replace it with 1, set it equal to 0, and then we'll be able to solve for k. Alright, so let me get my f prime back up here. All right, if I have a critical number at x equals 1, that means I can replace 1 in here, 1 in here, and set it equal to 0 because it's a critical number. So it has to equal 0 or it does not exist. I'm just going to go with x equals 0. And the function was defined at 1 anyway because let me kind of set it up here for just a minute. We were told that x values had to be greater than 0. Okay, so in the original function, um, what one worked, so if it works there, um, then it's a critical number, and it didn't look like it gave me any kind of interesting um, situation. Okay, so I'm going to let this be 0 when I plug 1 in for x. So 1 half k, 1 to the negative 1 half, oops, minus 1 over 1. All right, 1 to anything is 1, so that's just a half k minus 1. So I'm going to add 1 and multiply by 2. So real quickly, I'm just going to say k is 2. I've satisfied the first question. Now it says for this value of k, for 2, determine whether f has a min, max, or neither. Justify your answer. Well, if we think about how, how we have to identify a min or a max, we have, we have two ways we can do that. We can use the first derivative test, the first derivative number line, the f prime number line, if you will, or we also learned that we could use the second derivative test, which means I would have to, um, let's see, plug in, for this I'd have to plug one into the second derivative that I already found to see if it's uh, concave up or down. So, you know, actually that might be the quickest thing to try and test real quickly since I already found the second derivative. So, let me go ahead and get the second derivative back up here in front. I think it was negative one-fourth k to the negative three-halves um, plus one over x squared. All right, if we don't get zero, we're good. Let's see what happens. f double prime at one negative one-fourth, one raised to the negative three-halves plus one over one. So f double prime at one is equal to negative one-fourth, because one to anything is one, plus one, three-fourths. All right, so in that case, this value is positive. So if my second derivative at the critical number is positive, then I know it's concave up. The function is concave up, which means up like a cup, I have a feature of a minimum. So I'm going to say the function f has a relative min at x equals 1 because f prime of 1 is 0 and f double prime at 1 is positive. Goodness. Now you could do an f prime number line. I've done it in the past. A lot of work, a lot of calculations. Um, this just seemed to be the easiest. All right, let's look at part C. for a certain value of the constant k. So now it's kind of leading me to believe that k is no longer 2. It's just saying now consider that k is some other number, possibly 2, but doesn't have to be. Okay, so 
for a certain value of k, the graph of the function has a point of inflection. Stop right there. That means f double prime at some x value is equal to zero. For a certain value of this constant k, the graph of the function has a point of inflection. Okay, I got it. Double derivative zero on the x-axis. Well, if the point of inflection falls on the x-axis, then that means your function is zero. So whatever x is, the double derivative is zero. Whatever x is, the functional value is zero. Find this value of k. Brainstorming, thinking of a plan. Here's my plan. Set the function equal to zero, set the derivative equal to zero, set them equal to each other, and solve. So we have two equations with two unknowns. All right, so down here, zero equals, well, what was the second derivative? There it is. Uh, I hope it all came back. And the function? All right, the second derivative equals zero, the function equals zero. Um, they're both equal to zero, so we can set them equal to each other. Try and solve. I think a better approach might be if you look at this equation right here, let's solve it for k and substitute it in here. So I think I'll solve this equation for k and then sub it in there and then go from there. So I'm going to actually add the natural log here and divide by the square root of x to isolate k. So k is going to be natural log of x divided by the square root of x. And of course I can't reduce here because I can't detach x from the natural log. So I've got k, uh, what's left for me to find? I guess now I need to find x. Now I know what k is, I guess I'm going to have to substitute that in here. Okay, so let me see if I can do that right here in this space. So zero equals negative one-fourth natural log of x over square root of x, please don't disappear, times, uh, I think that was x to the negative three halves. I think there had to have been an x here is what it was. I think there should have been an x back up here, um, times uh, x to the negative 3 halves. Plus 1 over x squared. Okay, let me bring that up here and see if I can clean it up. Please don't disappear. So 0 equals negative 1 fourth. Remember, I'm trying to find k, a value of k, and it wasn't enough here. I think a lot of students stopped here, but we have to find a value of k. We have to keep going. So negative one-fourth natural log x divided by square root of x times, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this expression right here, and I'm going to rewrite it as 1 over q, uh, square root of x cubed. plus 1 over x squared. Oh my goodness, this is why I said you might need your own paper. Alright, 0 equals this whole product right here, negative natural log of x on top, 4 in the bottom, that product is the square root of x to the 4th, the square root of x to the 4th would be x squared plus 1 over x squared. 
Okay. Um, notice that it real, it'd be real easy for me to multiply this fraction by 4 over 4 to get a common denominator. So 0 equals, I would have 4x squared down here, and then I'd have negative natural log of x plus 4. Wow. Um, I could, I'm still trying to find k. Wow. I could take 0 and put it over 1. I could do cross products. So I have negative natural log of x plus 4 equals 0, which means natural log of x equals 4. Exponentiate both sides. e raised to the natural log of x is equal to e to the fourth. Wow. x equals e to the fourth. Goodness. Okay, x equals e to the fourth. Okay, I have to find k, so I'm going to come back here. Oh my goodness. And go ahead and plug in e to the fourth here and here. And I think when we do that, Know why my pen has disappeared. When we do that, when we plug in e to the fourth here, you should get a value for k. Natural log <clears throat> e to the fourth over square root of e to the fourth. I don't know. We'll touch base the next day and we'll see what you guys got when you simplified this for k. Now maybe you can see why I call this a 5 on a scale of 1 to 5 level of difficulty for a student. That's a lot of perseverance there. Um, yeah, it might be worth 3, 4, 5 points, but by you just showing that you know the interpretation of the problem is that you have to find these two equations equal to 0, I'm certain you would have gotten a point or two doing a little bit of work here. So at some point you just have to go, yeah, I ha I'm invested in this. I can continue with it. Um, uh, otherwise, you just do what you can and go to another problem and, and trying to get, you know, what, whatever you can off the other problem as well. Okay, I'll with you. All right, let's look at this upper left problem. Um, if you haven't read the problem, you might want to go ahead and read through it and uh, get to the question so you can kind of see where we're going with this. Uh, the question has to do with, and the question is the same on all of them here, um, to find the x values at which the graph of f, this is f prime, has a point of inflection. Um, so if we're looking for values at which the graph of f has a point of inflection, what we're looking for are relative mins and maxes on a slope graph. So if you kind of look at these locations right here, here's a min, here's a relative max, Okay, it appears that those are the only two locations at which I have a relative min and max on an f prime graph. Okay, that's where f prime is changing direction, which means if the f prime values change direction, that we have a point of inflection on the regular graph. Another way to think about that is this way. If this is f prime, then the value of this slope is f double prime. It's negative. The value of this slope is f double prime. The value of this slope is called an f double prime value. So all these f double prime values are negative. So if f double prime is negative, we know the graph is concave down. So the graph is also concave down here where this graph is decreasing. Think about the slopes here from this relative min to that relative max. The slope of f prime called f double prime is positive. So the whole time this graph is increasing, the slope, the rate of change is going to be positive and the slopes are f double prime values. So uh, what we're looking for for points of inflection from an f prime graph is we're looking for relative mins and maxes. So let's respond accordingly. f has a POI <coughs> at, didn't need those periods anyway, at x equals negative 2 because f prime, I'm not going to use the f double prime argument, especially if they give me an f prime graph. I'm just going to go with that justification because f prime changes from decreasing 
to increasing. And we all know that when that happens, the F prime graph changes from decreasing to increasing. We know that F double prime will change from negative to positive. F has a POI at x equals zero because this graph, F prime, changes from increasing to decreasing. So and that's the same thing as saying F double prime changes from um, positive to negative. And um, that, of course, indicates that we have a change in concavity and we have a, change, uh, we have a point of inflection thus. So hopefully you found these problems helpful.